stop messing around, stop fooling around, stop delaying, stop procrastinating, get up, get out, get it done. Everything is possible, nothing is a problem, and anything can be overcome. I just get my ass up out of bed, I get my shit together, and I get out and I start the fight. And that will transform you from uh, a mere mortal into a superhuman being. I've never, ever, ever met anybody who told me that they got rich watching their IRA or their 401k. Welcome back, Peter. How's it going? George, Happy I'm so psyched to be here. I'm psyched that you're here as well. What are we talking about today? Today, uh, I got some reactions for you. You want to get into it? I'll react. L let's do it. All right, here we go. If you want to make a billion dollars off Robert cash Ravani. Flow, this guy's crazy. He's based in Florida. Mohawk, boy, crazy beard. He lives in a house with like um, these gargoyles and like over the top <laughs> features. Was yeah, the of cash, cash flow. flow. Cash well, flow, he cash he's cash running around cash South cash Florida cash paying a lot of money, top dollar for every piece of high profile real estate he can get his hands on. So he's not looking for cash flow. He's looking to build his equity and have his appreciation. George, me, I look for both. I mean, I have to have cash flow out of the box. It's it's so important to me because otherwise I'm just guessing what markets are going to do. And right now I have no idea what markets are going to do. We have a war. There's oil at a hundred bucks a barrel now. There is inflation, unlike anything we've ever seen. There is political instability, all this stuff going on, and no one knows where markets are headed for all different types of assets, including real estate, and most importantly, real estate. So I look for both cash flow and appreciation. I'm in markets where if I do my job right and if I buy the right thing, I can have both. If you're buying in the swamps of Mississippi, what's up, Mississippi? <laughs> if you're buying in the swamps of Mississippi, you're likely not gonna have any appreciation to speak of, but man, will you have some good cash flow if you can keep your buildings full and people paying, right? If. Uh, whereas in urban centers and major metropolitan areas and major MSAs, you'll likely have a little bit less cash flow or a lot less cash flow, but a much higher probability or possibility of having some appreciation down the road with your real estate. Because these areas are very populated, everything's in high demand, there's nowhere to live, there's nowhere to work, there's nowhere to warehouse, there's nowhere to get self-storage, all that stuff is very, very few and far between in major MSAs. So that's gonna push pricing higher and cash flow lower. But Robert's out running around. He's spending a lot of money on every piece of trophy real estate he can find. He doesn't care about the cash flow today. He cares about the cash flow down the road and the appreciation, more importantly, down the road. George, I gotta have a little bit of both. I'm not as risky as that. I'm, I'm, I'm a far more conservative investor. I need cash flow, I need yield, and I need to have ways to force appreciation or realize appreciation. So, but he, look, he's a gunslinger. I mean, everything about this guy is like, you know, superhero status with the way he dresses and the way he talks and how he's rolling and the stuff that he's buying. I'm more conservative than that. And the uh, house I, is wild. I think I'm probably older than him, which is why I'm more conservative, but, but he's out buying all these, these trophy assets and class A properties and looking the way he does, he's like turning heads and uh, he's an interesting guy. He's an engaging guy. I, I, I follow him. I've seen him before in, uh, in social media and at other uh, real estate events, and he's he's definitely a we'll high-profile gunslinger. Wow, yeah, yeah that, that'd be fun. Good. He's yeah. Uh, yeah. maybe I'll grow a mohawk, yeah. <laughs> and then that'll be my funny thing. I'll take off my hat, and he'll be like, "Oh, Siegel, you have a mohawk I when you're usually bald." I'm definitely into that. Maybe people would think that. That, was, that was funny. Hundred yeah, percent. Cool. Well, that's the only reaction I have today because we have a lot to talk about at the table. So let's go. Let's, let's head over. All right. Back to the table, Peter. George. How you been? It's been, been a little bit of time. It's been like two nice weeks. Nice to see. Has it been two weeks? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Well, we must have a lot to talk about you know, today. We do have a lot to talk Let's about. Let's talk business, man. Sounds I feel good. like yeah. business and entertainment finally meet when you and I get to shoot this podcast. <laughs> Because I want to be entertaining, but I want right. to talk about business. I don't want to be entertaining and talk like smack like I do with my buddies out no, totally. at a bar or something yeah. if I were ever to go to a bar, which I don't yeah. really do that. Yeah. But like, you know, sitting around talking smack like watching football, you know how you talk smack 100%. watching a game? Yeah. I want to talk smack about business. Okay. So I feel like uh, it's business and entertainment. Fantastic. I'm 
very excited for more smack talk during the daily cash. We can talk some smack. (laughs) So the first thing I want to bring up was Fed interest rate hike. Will that raise mortgages and increase rental demand? Do you think? What do you see coming as far as that goes? The Fed raises interest rates in response to inflation. Right. And we know that historically rents are correlated with inflation. So as inflation rises, so do rents. That's why real estate's a hedge against inflation. So what you're asking about is if interest rates are rising, will rents rise? Well, I think the real question is if inflation continues to rise, will rents continue to rise? The answer to that is yes. Interest rates follow inflation. And so as interest rates rise, you're gonna see rents continue to rise, but not because of the interest rates, because it's inflation. They're all tied together. We know from history, we know from the economic machine, we know the inputs, we know what happens when there is an increase in supply of money and an increase in inflation and interest rates follow, rents are gonna follow. This is gonna exacerbate cost of housing and housing affordability issues. But what's interesting about it, George, is that since we're talking about housing affordability, one of my favorite topics, as interest rates rise and as inflation rises and as rents rise, all in concert, you're gonna see the cost of renting become more expensive, and you're gonna see the housing market adjust a little bit because what's gonna happen is it's gonna become more expensive for would-be buyers to get into those homes. So rather than having a $2,500 a month payment with a 2.7% home mortgage rate, we're gonna have a $4,500 a month payment with a four or 5% mortgage rate, and it's gonna push certain people out of the buyer market. They're gonna stay renting for a long time. So I think it's a good thing for the multifamily market and for the, the rental market. But uh, housing affordability will, will fluctuate. There's still a lot of demand. You know what I've been seeing a lot the past two weeks since you said it was yeah, two weeks yeah, since we last yeah, spoke? Yeah. Articles everywhere about how we're not gonna see adjustments in housing prices this year. 2022, maybe next year in 2023. Why? Because there's so much demand. All these markets are still hot. They're still selling. Maybe not the sight unseen bidding wars that we had over uh, the, yeah, the summer yeah. and, 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 the, and the spring last year, but there's still a, a lack of supply of housing. George, when you have a lack of supply and demand is high, prices go up. People are saying that that condition is going to persist through this year and then maybe back off in 2023? I don't know. There's a lot of things going on right now that are going to dictate housing affordability. Yeah, uh, we, we had a lack of supply before the pandemic, so it's nothing new. This just sort of revealed that this pandemic environment that we're in now, there's nowhere to find yield. So we're seeing that too. People are buying single family homes, condos and apartments and renting yeah. them out because they just want to secure their real estate and maybe they'll move in in 10 years or something like that yeah. after they get 10 years worth of rent. Yeah, you know, I mean, you mentioned no yield like with even with the impending interest rate hike, banks are flush with cash, and it seems like a yeah. lot of people are talking about how there's not going to be any you know, yield on those savings accounts. The banks are, have never been more flush with right. cash, yeah. and they're lowering the deposit yeah. yields. Yeah, exactly. You would think that they would hire them. Yeah. That they would hire them. Yeah. You would think that they would increase them. <laughs> yeah. See, that's where you got to talk the smack. Right. So you say, Peter, I don't think the language right, yeah. that you're speaking is, but that's what you would think that banks would increase right. rates as supply and demand in the banking industry adjusts to what it is now. Yeah. Banks are lowering their deposit yields. They're paying you less money because they don't need your money because they're so flush with cash from all this money that's swimming around. They don't need your money for the deposit. They're lowering the yield. They're already paying nothing. Now they're paying less than nothing. It's crazy. But yeah, the do banks th- don't need it. Do you think that'll increase banking customers, you know, investing directly instead of this kind of middleman. I think there's a lot of things. So now you're talking about whether the consumer is going to continue to do business with the banks. Uh, I I think banks are a short and well, I think branch banking is a short for for the medium to long term. Mm -hmm. I think that right now we're in a world where there's Chase banks and city banks on every street corner everywhere, sometimes more than one. It's crazy, right? If you live in a city, you'll see like a city bank here and a city bank here, and then on the other corner is Chase. And yep. I mean, they're like every corner. I think that's all gonna go away or change drastically. I think branch banking as we know it is completely done. No longer are you gonna need to walk into a branch to cash a check, to withdraw funds, to make payments on anything to uh, shop for those products that you need, like a home mortgage or a car loan or anything. Why? Because uh, the consumer has more access to these types of products without traditional branch banking providing it to them. DeFi is coming and it's coming fast. Let me tell you, it's already out there. But in another five years, 10 years, as DeFi proliferates and grows, you're going to be able to get 
rates on home mortgages and auto loans and deposit accounts way better than branch banking in its traditional form has ever been able to give us. Yeah. It's going to be nuts. So I think it's going to be an interesting real, I, I think maybe we've even spoken about this before. Yeah. I'm remembering, but I right. think that there's going to be a reshuffling of the deck. All of these banks that sign leases on corner retail spaces, they're going to have to repurpose those leases or sell them. Yeah. I don't think there's going to be a lot of branch banking. And yeah, George, I think the consumer is going to find other ways to do what it needs to do with its money. Yeah, I mean, the thing that you've brought up a few times on this podcast, uh, for sure, and then you know, multiple times personally, is the banks don't save that money that we save with them. What, are the, what do they do with the money? When you deposit money in the bank, what do they do with they it? They invest it. And so it right. just seems natural that as customers become more aware of that, they would do that instead, instead of giving it to the bank. There's so many yeah. opportunities for the regular common investor, whether you're accredited, whether you're non-accredited, there's so many more opportunities today to be an investor than there was five years ago. As soon as five years ago, yeah. and certainly even 10 and 20 years ago, there was nothing. You had to be an accredited investor to do all of these things yeah. and invest in own income producing real estate. And maybe you had a stock account and certainly you had a 401k because that's the product that they create to keep you locked in. <laughs> There's so many opportunities today. I, I can think of 20 or 30 just off the top of my head between Acorn, Stash, Robinhood, Happy Nest, Ground Floor, uh, Cadre, all the crowdfunding sites, all the, I mean, there's so many different sites that specialize in offering the common person through an electronic digital web platform, the ability to invest 10 bucks, 100 bucks, 1,000 bucks. I mean, this is great stuff. It's gonna start teaching us all how to think like investors, how to think like owners, and how to be investors. Our schools don't teach us this. Our government doesn't want this to happen. So I think this is a good thing that there's all these different platforms now to become an investor. Just obviously be careful. You know, you don't want to rush into anything and spend money on anything and invest in anything. Educate yourself. But I think the fact that it's available to the consumer, to the average regular person out there, is only good. They're going to need banks less. They're going to need less banking services. And the banks are going to have to retool their entire business models to keep up. Well, and the fact that you don't have to be an accredited investor now it allows you to test the waters a bit more and, you know, invest in small amounts, see how yeah. it works and, and learn a little bit, uh, you know, in a less risky format rather than, you know, millions and millions of dollars. You can, you, you can own a part of a REIT. Yeah. I mean, happiness yeah. for as little as $10 pays you six or 7%. Yeah. Disclosure, I'm involved with happiness. I'm on the board of directors, but I, the reason I chose to be involved was because I think it's a great thing. Yeah. It democratizes investing for everybody out there. Yeah. Ground floor is another one. You yeah. can you can get even higher returns. They Ground floor places commercial debt on real estate. So, and, and again, as little as $10, yeah. it's an amazing thing. So these opportunities are out there, find them and start thinking like an owner, start thinking like an investor because that's what you need. You gotta change the mind first. The action's gotta come next. And when you do that, you're gonna start the path out of the, the rat cycle that yeah. you're maybe in right now. Yeah, totally. So keeping in the bank conversation, you heard this thing about Bank OZK? The, the, the They're the bank. ones that are lending on all the new construction. Yeah, so crazy. Yeah, because yeah, there's you, always one. Yeah, you had mentioned Citibank and that, that they're holding more construction debt than Citibank or Bank of America, right? Yeah. Which is crazy. So there's all, I, I remember 15, 20 years ago, there was a, a Chinese bank in New York City, either mm -hmm. like Bank of China or yeah. Chinese Savings or something like that. It had the word China in it. Yeah. And they were funding all of the development and all of the commercial deals in New York City, way above and beyond what like the normal players in the banking industry in, in New York regional area were doing. They were like the standout. They had like billions and billions more than like the, the next guys combined. And so it seems like Bank OZK is now the new Bank of China, which has stepped in and they're lending on all the construction projects. You know, it might be a little risky if they're a smaller bank. I don't know enough about how many assets that Bank OZK has and who's backing them. But look, the banks are in business to put money out on the street. You just said it yourself a second ago. Right. When yeah. you take, when you put your money in the bank, they don't just hold it, they invest it. So they're paying you under 1% and they're putting that money out and lending it and securitizing it uh, for uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10%. And that seems like a pretty darn good deal. Look, if I could pay you uh, 0 0.1 of 1% and turn around and lend it at five or 8%, I, I'd do that all day, wouldn't you? Sure yeah, you would, that's yeah. like a 5,000. <laughs> percent return on your money. So that's how banks make money. There's always one bank that's the standout. So if you're looking for a bank to fund your business or your venture or your building, uh, keep looking around a lot if you're not finding the terms you want. There's always one who will do it. Yeah. 
So this is something you you kind of brought to my attention, but I had seen it in in some of the headlines. The ECNY, uh, it's uh, the like electronic that, payment system. Yeah, yeah. yeah that Ch- China had that electronic payment system, and it didn't end up going through as well as they had hoped. But it was <laughs> it was uh, it's early. Yeah, it was a big question mark uh, in the beginning because for years and years and years, Visa has been the only way to do that. So, yeah. Yeah, w- what did you think about that? Well, I think that Visa and Mastercard are another one that that's under attack. Mm. Why? Because there's new competition and new players in the e-payment space. And it's so easy for people to pay not using Visa and MasterCard. There's Apple Pay, there's the there's all sorts of other ways that are growing and coming into the scene. Crypto and e-payments with crypto technologies is one way. Uh, the countries are developing their own, China you just mentioned. Mm-hmm. So Visa and MasterCard, like the traditional banks that have branches everywhere, they're gonna be under attack because their business is gonna change very rapidly. And it might be five or seven or eight, 10 years, but hey, that's rapidly. Let me tell you, these companies, they don't move so quickly. The huge companies lack the agility and the flexibility of smaller uh, entrepreneurial driven uh, corporate cultures. So these companies, they're gonna have to adjust or they're gonna get Swallowed. Yeah, because I know Amazon also just had a spat with Visa about, um, I think in England, that they were trying to suspend Visa payments on Amazon. You know, in, in the, the UK, largest so retailer in, place, in the yeah. world wants to suspend yeah. Visa. Yeah. I mean, so, so if they, you're Visa, I'd be pretty pissed no, and pretty, pretty scared no, about pretty that. Yeah. So right. It, yeah, they got through it, but it's still, you know, as you said, it's they're under attack. At what know? cost did they right. get through yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I have to, I have to go back and find out. Because it they, wasn't just, hey, man, come on, right. let the customers <laughs> pay with Visa. It wasn't yeah. that. There's yeah. a cost to it, significant one. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Denver released a new housing mandate. Denver, Colorado? Yeah, yeah. So if this proposal passes, a developer building an apartment complex in downtown would need to reserve between 10 and 15% of those units okay. for making uh, less than area median income. So basically, like affordable housing. It's affordable housing ordinance. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. they don't, they have to pay a fee of like $300,000. Yep. Do you, what effect do you think that's going to have on the real estate market over there? So there's cities everywhere, not just Denver, that are adopting affordable housing ordinances. Having It's called a set-aside. So having a certain number of units set aside in your new development, your new construction for affordable housing, it's a common thing. We've seen it for a long time. Denver is considering 10 to 15% as the set-aside. So if you're building a 100-unit building, they're talking about requiring the developer to set aside 10 to 15 units. I like it. Here's why I like it. Other cities are requiring 20, 22, 25%. Completely crazy. No developer is going to set aside 20 or 25% of their units. The numbers just don't work. You can't just cut off 20 or 25% of of your economics and still agree to take risk, borrow, and build. It doesn't happen. Now, the other thing that these cities and towns do is they incentivize. They say, okay, set aside 10 to 15%. We'll give you more height. We'll change the zoning. You'll, you'll be able to uh, go up another few floors, so you'll make up some units there. I think that's great. Denver's trying to work with its developers. There's a lot of cities and municipalities. George, we live in an area, New York, New Jersey, you know, a lot of the blue states, they're not really working with, with the developers. They're not really pro-business. They're not really inviting developers into their towns and saying, we need the rateables, go ahead and build. You have to set aside 20 to 25%. You want to know what the developers are doing? They're going to Denver. Yeah, <laughs> right. Or they're yeah. going to Texas. Yeah. Or they're going to Georgia. Or they're going to Florida or Tennessee. These other states and municipalities are way more incentivizing and these developers are gonna put their dollars in those areas. George, you've heard me talk about this a lot. The first thing I'll look at when investing my money is what the investing environment is, economically, politically, legislatively. What are the town councils like? What's the state governor like? I mean, it's a mess everywhere, but there's a lot of states that are open for business. They want the development. They want the business and the entrepreneurs to come. They want capital investment to be made. Here in New Jersey, man, it's tough, let me tell you. I mean, it's crazy. We have 20 to 25% set asides in a lot of towns in New Jersey. That's a, a common thing. People won't yeah. build. Yeah. They won't build. Yeah. So the towns ring the bell to go, yeah, we just won affordable housing. We're the affordable housing champions. We got this ordinance passed requiring 20 to 25% set aside. Yeah, but in practice. No yeah. one builds. So really, they have 20 to 25% set aside of nothing because nobody's building. It's too much of an ask. 5%, 8%. 10%, 12%, and we'll give you some more height, and we'll give you some more density so you can make it up. Okay, that's a conversation and we can talk. And that's a way to get affordable units built, and we need affordable units in this country and everywhere. So I'm a fan of affordable housing efforts. I'm a fan of 
affordable housing legislation, but it's got to be smart, and it's got to be workable, and it's got to be realistic. I mean, George, if you say hypothetically, oh, we have a 50% set aside. If you want to build in our town, you have to set aside 50% of your, your, your units for affordable housing. No one's going to do it. So you lower the number to 40, you lower the number to 35, 20. At some point, the developer's going to say, okay. So I think that point is uh, around 5 to 12%. George, I applaud Denver. They're getting legislation passed that incentivizes development and also creates affordable housing. We need the affordable housing. There's a housing shortage everywhere, not just Denver, everywhere. Look up in your own town and your own state and see what the, uh, the affordable housing uh, supply and demand imbalances are. And you know, you'll see the towns that should be getting to work creating this legislation. You got to let them build. Legislation for affordable housing by itself doesn't work. It's got to be workable with the developers. Include the developers in the conversation. They're the ones that are spending the money. They're the ones that are taking the risk. You got to make it easy for them. Just now you said smart, uh, practical, and successful. These are words that I would not associate with the American Dream Mall right now. And The American so, yeah. Dream Mall. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of New Jersey. <laughs> Speaking of New Jersey. Speaking of, yeah. So that was something I want to bring up. That it's been almost 20 years and now <sighs> they're, you know, they're open-ish uh, and struggling to make debt payments. What does that signal to you? Well, nothing new. They were struggling to make debt payments five years ago, 12 years ago, eight years ago. So this isn't a new story that they're struggling, but they are trying to come out the other side of the tunnel and see the light a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, there's a pandemic, so that sucks for them. If you're a shopping mall, if you're a public gathering place, pandemics are not good for you, you know? So unfortunately for them, they got their shit together and got to the leasing phase when the pandemic hit and it just, it's tough. So people aren't really going there, but look, as we come out of the pandemic, as we come out of the pandemic, People are gonna need places to gather. They're gonna to wanna to go be in public events. They're gonna to wanna to shop. The mall is is more than just shopping. I mean, it's it's really a public gathering place. There's art, there's culture, there's events, there's all these things that are happening there. Fully realized, it's gonna be a tremendous thing, but like, man, what a, what a number of setbacks yeah, they've had together. over the years. Yeah. I mean, there was 08, there was, there's the pandemic. I mean, you can only survive like one of those things at best. They've they've had a few of those things. I would not want to be an owner of a mall or a strip center, no matter how big or small. In fact, I sold all of my uh, retail strip centers and commercial spaces. Right, because that's something you were into it a while ago. Yeah, 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 they're just they're just tough. But like, that is an unbelievable property, and what a whole lot of friggin' money that yeah, thing costs. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah I'm glad I'm not invested in that. <laughs> Uh, something we haven't talked about on the podcast before is uh, weed revenue. <laughs> so weed revenue. Weed revenue. So just some, jump right in and call uh, it weed. I'm just gonna We're not a business it. show. You uh, could call it cannabis yeah, yeah, if you yeah, wanted yeah, to. No, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna go for weed. Yeah. So, so, but cannabis. Call it revenue, stank ass. Yeah. You know, give me some more <laughs> slang. Why don't I know this? Yeah, buds. Uh, yeah, it's all these. It's, you know, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, so cannabis weed revenue. revenue Higher than alcohol in Massachusetts. This Are you year. surprised? Uh, I'm not surprised. Alcohol's been around for. 2,000 years. Yeah. Yeah. How do you see this playing out for the industry? I, I, I um, <laughs> George, it, it is no, it's not shocking to me yeah. that, that weed revenue is surpassing alcohol anywhere. Forget yeah. about Boston, but anywhere else. I've made some cannabis industry investments over the past couple of years. I think I've shared that with you. I believe it's going to be the thing that moves the needle in our society. These states need money. Our country needs money. There's, there's no new places to get it. Betting, online gambling, and cannabis, those are the new industries. They're gonna supply a ton of money to states and governments everywhere. We need it. Colorado, when they first uh, got open for business in cannabis, I think it was like $300 million it gave to the state in the first year. Massachusetts, look, they like to smoke their weed up there as much as they do out west in Colorado and Oregon and Washington State. Not a shocker, people love it. There's a high demand, for, there's, there's an exorbitant demand for it. It's got so many uses, not just recreationally, the way that we're sort of joking about, but like medicinally, yeah. spiritually, there's all these uses for it. It's good shit, you know? It's natural, it's organic, it's a plant. You know, the medical, could industry, be the, the medical industry is gonna be huge in, in terms of that. Well, the, yeah, it would be huge, although the you know pharmaceutical industrial complex, <laughs> I'm sure doesn't want that. Yeah, but they're gonna true. get involved too, because yeah, they're sure. gonna want a piece of that. No, I'm sure we'll, we'll have a, a new Pfizer version of cannabis yeah. coming out. I'm just now. surprised that you didn't say to me that weed revenue surpassed alcohol revenue by like 40 times. Right, yeah, yeah. Because so. I, I believe that that's coming. Yeah, no, totally. Well, and it's still early. So. Yep, we're yeah. in the first inning of this. Yeah. And last thing that I was gonna touch on is Ray Dalio, 
talking about Civil Ray War. Dalio. Yeah. You know, a lot of people think he's nuts. Yeah, no, I know that. I, I don't. Yeah. So yeah. So what are your thoughts? And his he came out and said the U.S. is fostering an environment that's ripe for civil war in some oh, form. Oh, the civil war thing. Civil war. I've heard yeah. him say that. Yeah. So unfortunately, I think he's right. Mm. Why? So look at what we have going on. Divisiveness. I've never seen more of it. Have you? I mean, we are so screwed up and divisive. Uh, income inequality, racial inequality, political c combativeness, monotheism. My God's better than your God. If you don't think the way that I think, you suck and I'm right. It's everywhere you look. It seems fewer opportunities traditionally and people are suffering more and health is has never been more at risk. We're fat, we're overweight, we're sick. Forget even the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic just sheds a, a magnifying glass on that stuff, but it's like, I've never seen our country and our people be so divided and so against each other on everything. The last time our country, we as a people were together as a society was 9-11. That event united us. Didn't matter income, race, age, whatever. It was like we were American, we got attacked. It's, you know, we all had that in common and we felt unity. We haven't felt it since then and, yeah, and I remember, I remember thinking horrible. at the beginning of pandemic, I was thinking like, oh, well maybe this will be that, you know, kind of common enemy that unites people and it's amazing how wrong oh. that, <laughs> that opinion was. Yeah, regretfully, I think that Ray yeah. is onto something. Yeah. I think that we are fostering an environment where there's just separation and divisiveness and anger and bitterness and it's manifesting itself in all sorts of different ways. Mental health, never been worse in our history. Financial insecurity, never been worse in our history. I mean, people are nuts. They're breaking off in factions and separatist groups and every day there's like new ones that pop up that are yelling and screaming about something and they're not wrong. Everything's a problem. I'll tell you what though, as problematic as everything is, I, just, I have to say this, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else and I wouldn't want to live in anywhere else. This is still the best place to live despite its problems, despite the divisiveness, because there's opportunity, there's freedoms, and that's important to have. I mean, imagine if you lived in Afghanistan or you know one of these places where Ukraine. it's just, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you could live there, yeah. you know, people wanna talk about women's rights and in our country, and it's a very important issue, and it's one that I'm fond of, but like, imagine if you lived in these places in the Middle East where like, women don't have any rights. And I'm, I'm glad that my family and I don't live in these places that we live here. So yeah, it's fucked up. And yeah, I think we're fostering an environment for a civil war, but I think the answer to that is let's just figure it out. Let's get better. Let's get stronger individually. I mean, personal growth, development, education. You know, you don't have to be a billionaire to live a good life. You have to be happy and happiness is defined with everyone in different ways. So find your happiness. If it's money you want, there's ways to get it and there's newer and more ways today than ever before to be successful financially. Uh, if you're not interested in having lots of money, but you're interested in education and spiritual growth, you can do that. I mean, you could chase whatever you wanna chase here, which, which is really good. But you know, happiness is a key part of it. Be happy. I think a lot of people lately aren't that happy. And that's why we're hearing Ray Dalio say that we're fostering an environment for, for civil war. I agree with him. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, I feel I heard somebody say recently that the the concept of loyal opposition has kind of completely gone out it's the window. It's gone. That, that at one point, you know, you could kind of trust that, okay, the other side is going to oppose you, mm -hmm. but they're going to be loyal to the general cause to try and it, you know, bring it, things together. And that's, yeah, uh, you know. we're not talking about the hard stuff anymore. Yeah. And if we do, we disagree and we separate further. It's it, very few uh, times do I find that uh, two opposite sides of an issue can come together and talk and have a dialogue that's open and honest without repercussions of disrespect and anger and violence. And, uh, you know, it's well, crazy. I think that's what's part going of it on. too is that the, the issues that are being brought up are so often the polarizing issues, which are important and do need to be talked about, but that there are other issues that are also very important that we could come together on, and oftentimes we don't. We don't. <laughs> Most of the time we don't. Um, and so that's the thing. I think yeah. a friend of mine recently talked about how we're all often forgetting that the other person is afraid. You know, that, that we're saying that we're afraid. Oh, I like that. We're, that we're, we're often reacting to our own fear, but then also forgetting that that other person is probably reacting because they're that afraid. That sounds like some jungle animal analogy. Like, Interesting. You know? Yeah. yeah. Like the aardvark is afraid and the lion, well, the lion's not going to be afraid of the aardvark, but right, like, right, yeah. you know, it sounds to me like, well, I think it's a good point. We never know what the other person's feeling or going through, but we have to assume that they're concerned and afraid.
as well. I, th- I feel like you brought up, brought up the jungle thing. I think we need Richard Attenborough's voice, or uh, David Attenborough, sorry, Richard's the actor. David Attenborough's voice to come on and say... Can you yeah. put it up right here? Let's do an audio yeah, sure. tag yeah, and yeah, yeah. make not, that happen. Okay. And so, here we observe a wild United States in its natural habitat on the brink of civil war. And yet, we relish the idea that with hope and perseverance, it may live to see another day. All right, well, that's what I got today. Anything else you want to I have a zest quest on? for oh, you, George. You have a zest quest. Yeah. Let's go. What drives your fashion decisions? I noticed that today you look very hipster-like, which I'm happy <laughs> and proud about, but you're yeah. not wearing the loud, bright primary colors. You're that's more true. toned down. Yeah. And it's a warm sort of uh, sunny day out. It's oh, 70 nice. degrees around here in yeah. February, so that's atypical. Yeah. Tell me about what drives your fashion decisions. I feel like it's often based on frequency. So Can we I, get a picture of George up there right like, now? Thank you. But yeah, it's often frequency, I think. that if I have Frequency. Worn, yeah, if I've worn a bright color the day before, I'll often do a toned down color the day after. And I thought you were talking know, about like spiritual frequency or oh, audio no. frequency. No, I wish that was as yeah. esoteric. As you're, you're, you're just well, talking about how many times a week you do laundry. Yeah, yeah no, totally. Yeah. So that, um, I think with the, the hat, I often wear because if my hair's, I just wash my hair and it's a little bit mm. messy. So I feel like that, you know, brings it in together. And then the bracelets are the things <laughs> I've gathered over time. So George Robson, like, everybody, the world wants to know. Here yeah. you have it. George, your fashion <laughs> example. Follow and him. Feature me in T Magazine. Next week. Yeah. All right, well, thanks so much, Peter. I'll see you over in Q&A. Thanks, everybody. All right, Peter, ready for some Q&A? George, give me some Q&A, but give me the question from an incredible name today. (laughs) I want, like... You know, Elizabeth Kacharski or something like so the that. The incredible name today is Alicia Nielsen. Alicia Nielsen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. There you go. A little bit more straight up the middle. What's yeah. up, Alicia? What's I'm excited your question? to hear your answer for this one. She says, should I listen to Dave Ramsey and focus solely on paying down my debt or invest at the same time? I'm trying right. to get out of student debt, but I'm afraid that I'm missing out on the opportunity to invest. You know, look, Dave Ramsey, I'm not a fan. Like, either you love the guy or you don't. I'm not a fan. Here's why. I'm an investor. I want to deploy capital. Whatever capital I have, my job is to put it out on the street and have it work as efficiently and, and to the maximum as possible. George, I use debt often, almost always. And we always hear the phrases good debt, bad debt. Well, George, I deploy debt all the time and it's good debt. The reason is, is because the debt is serviced by the income that the asset generates and I'm able to deploy less capital into that asset because I, I can obtain leverage. We've spoken about how in multifamily we can get 70, 75 LTV, loan to value, No other business can give you those types of LTVs. I'm a big fan of that because what other business can you get in where the banks are tripping over themselves to give you the money, up to 75% of the money that you need to get into business. So I'm looking for these opportunities and I want to deploy, in most cases, 70 or 75% LTV. I wanna use that good debt. I've got healthy debt service coverage ratios that I make sure I have before I go in and purchase the business or the asset. And I know that I can service my debt and my mortgage with a high degree of confidence and a high degree of probability and likelihood that I'll continue to pay that mortgage month after month after month forever and not have any issues and enjoy all the cash flow that comes from that. So no, I'm not rushing to go pay down debt. So should you wait to invest? I wanna deploy whatever capital I have as quickly as possible into an asset that's generating income for me. I wanna make a good investment decision. I wanna underwrite it well. I don't wanna rush into the investment, but I wanna get my money out of the banks and I wanna get it into income producing assets, businesses, real estate, what have you. So uh, for me, George, I wanna be an investor, not a saver. I wanna be an investor at the business level, not a borrower of debt at the consumer level where I'm getting auto loans and home loans and credit card debt and student debt and all of this stuff. I wanna be getting into debt on the good side of the debt fence, which is debt secured by income producing assets, real estate businesses. So if you wanna wait to invest, I don't know. I don't wanna wait to invest. The only way I can get ahead is by investing today. And I know if I invest today, it's better than if I invest tomorrow. And it might mean that I have to take on some debt to buy that building or that business. And that can be okay if you're doing your underwriting, if you know your metrics, if you know your market, if you're an expert in the area that you're gonna be investing in, or if you've learned a lot about it, you're gonna make an informed decision. And it's okay in most cases to deploy a little bit of debt to help you buy those, those investments and those assets. As opposed to taking out a high interest rate auto loan to buy a Lambo or leveraging up on your house or getting a HELOC and a second mortgage on your house 
And look, we've all had a little bit of consumer debt in our lives. If you're gonna get consumer debt, pay off the high interest stuff with the low interest stuff, do the balance transfers, look for opportunities to pay off high interest car loans, refinance your house into lower interest rate products. George, you have to have a good FICO score. You have to be a strong borrower in the eyes of the lender and the bank. But for me, I want to invest, not wait. If I'm saving anything, I'm anxious, I want to get it out and be investing. That's me, I hope that helps her. Hell yeah. All right, thanks so much, Peter. Thank I'll you. see you next time.